You may have heard the term recently, the data is the new oil. But what exactly does that mean? How is data related to something as monumental of a shift and a major force in our society that oil was? Oil enabled the Industrial Revolution, changes in the way we grow our food, and many more unintended consequences for society. But how does that apply to data? And what does that mean? For us. My name is Frank Lavinia and I'm a software engineer. In fact, I've been a software engineer my entire career. I saw the rise of the web, the dot-com boom, and the dot-com bust. I saw the rise of .NET and the rise of various open source platforms. However, throughout it all, there's always been a consistent theme. You write code, you test code, you deploy code. You essentially write algorithms to solve business problems. But data science flips this normal paradigm on its head. Instead of writing algorithms to solve problems, the algorithms that solve problems are already written and you just pick and choose which ones to apply to your particular solution. You don't so much write the code as you assemble the code. Now this is very intimidating and confusing for software engineers. Trust me, I know. But one of the more frustrating barriers is the math. Now sure you may say, well, we're software engineers, we do math all the time. Well, that's the external perception, but you and I know that's not totally true. In fact, we rarely get beyond simple algebra. Sometimes if you're writing games, you do more advanced physics and trigonometry, but for the most part, we don't dive too deep into the ocean of mathematics. This is different in data science as most of it requires some knowledge of advanced statistics. Now, even if you've taken statistics in college, you probably don't have fond memories of it. But I'm here to tell you that statistics are your friend and they're a lot more approachable than you would think. Unfortunately, a lot of the existing training materials are not geared towards software engineers. They're geared more towards, well, the academic crowd. And that can be very intimidating if you're just starting to get into the field when they start dropping all sorts of formula and other things that are, well, somewhat incomprehensible. And that's what this course is aimed to do, to make a statistician of yourself. Well, kind of. It's designed to give you the tools you need to be successful in data science. And trust me, if you're already a software engineer, you already have the hardware and the software to succeed in this field. Over the last decade, the term big data came into prominence. And the rush was on, and thanks to the cloud, cheap storage, and ample bandwidth to collect and organize as much data as possible. However, holding the data is only part of the equation. Now the rush is on making data smart data, or making smart decisions based on the data that you already have. In other words, companies want to make the right decision at the right time for the right customers to have the best possible outcomes. By anticipating customer behaviors and even market conditions, companies can minimize risk and turn a nice profit because they are aware of the future before it happens. But how does this happen? Is it magic? No, it's not magic, it's math. And let's get into that now. Hello and welcome to Data Science for Developers. I'm Frank Lavinia, a data scientist at Wintelect. As I alluded to in my intro segment, a lot of things about data science can seem, well, like magic. But to quote Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's the case here. In this course, we'll take a closer look and see the science behind the magic. In this class, we'll cover some of the basics of data science, including what is data science? What is data analytics? And who is a data scientist? We'll also get into machine learning, the types of machine learning, and the thought experiments to help you understand some of the core concepts. And as we go along, you'll see you are actually a lot more familiar with this than you actually thought. So first off, 
what is data science exactly? Well, clearly, a lot of people would say, well, it's the hot new thing. In fact, Harvard Business Review calls it the sexiest job of the 21st century. But is it the hot new thing? Well, not really. It's not all that new. In fact, a lot of data science looks an awful lot like predictive statistics. There's also other terms that are bounced around. Classification, regression, AI, ML, RL, and math. There's an awful lot of math built into data science. He who makes a statistician of himself gets rid of the pain of being a data scientist. In other words, math is better when you know its purpose. Now, I'm not saying that being a data scientist is a pain. I'm just saying that at its core, you have to have a good understanding of statistics and a healthy respect for the mathematical underpinnings. But next, you may be wondering, well, why is it called data science? Well, in short, because data scientists generally follow the scientific method, whereas that you first you observe a phenomena, then you compose a theory, then you propose a hypothesis or a prediction. You then run an experiment and then once again, observe the results. And the next question that often comes up is, well, what is data analytics? Well, in short, data analytics comes in three flavors, descriptive analytics, predictive analytics, and prescriptive analytics. Descriptive analytics has to do with, well, describing the data, uh, coming up with metrics like the mean, the median, the variance, also categorization, such as clustering, or reducing the dimensions, or coming up with density estimates. Predictive analytics, as the name implies, involves predicting the future. And that could be, well, a simple regression, where given a certain input, you can predict a certain output. For instance, tracking the amount of hot coffee or hot cocoa that is sold based on the temperature of the day. And finally, you have the prescriptive category, where this basically means providing solutions for potential problems, such as optimizing travel routes. Now here's the question that everyone has been asking. Who is a data scientist? Well, there's an old joke that a data scientist is a statistician who can write code, or a coder who has more than a basic understanding of statistics. Well, while that's not totally true, there does lie a grain of truth in it. The serious answer is, well, there really is no clear definition. Very often you'll find data scientists have PhDs in math or statistics. And very often they are also data architects, software engineers, or subject matter experts. And all of this really speaks to the fact that data science is a convergence of disciplines. Essentially, it's a mashup of math and statistics, computer science, and domain expertise. It also helps that if you have a good foundation in communicating the findings that you have uncovered in your research. This plays a huge part in the field of data visualization. Very often it's been said that data scientists are unicorns. Well, I don't know if they're necessarily unicorns, but as you can see from the Venn diagram on the screen, it is a rare person indeed that has expert level skills in all three of these areas. Now, it's also important to, well, unravel the lingo of data science. 
Very often, it's easy to go out to YouTube and do a search for data science and how to get started in data science, only to be, well, discouraged by some of the buzzwords and lingo that are used there without a lot of background explanation. The goal here is to help you kind of get a good picture of where things fall into place inside the data science world as well as understand just enough to get started and not be intimidated. Well, as you can see, there's already a lot of buzzwords around data science. There's artificial intelligence, there's machine learning. You may have heard from the BI world the term data mining. Well, how does this all fit in? Well, first off, data science is a catch-all term for a number of technologies. But most of the interesting stuff is happening inside the machine learning and artificial intelligence space. Basically, artificial intelligence is the idea of replicating natural intelligence with computer code. Now, part of that is machine learning. And machine learning itself branches off into three general subcategories. There's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Now also part of this is uh, the idea of data mining. Um, now some people would think it's controversial that I put natural language processing or the ability for a computer to understand the actual intent of text or sentiment determination inside data mining. However, my rationale is simple. The idea is you're trying to extract value out of a stream of text. And that's not a trivial task to do. Uh, so I consider that kind of data mining, uh, you know, a lot of this, it's hard to really kind of give it nice, neat hierarchy. There is a bit of, well, wiggle room, but this map should give you a framework to kind of mentally map it to the point where you can get started. So the idea here is to explain to you that data science is the catch-all term. Artificial intelligence is the first sub-level. And then below that, things kind of get, well, a bit fuzzier. Machine learning certainly is a key part of it. And that's the part we're going to focus on next. So the first question is, well, what exactly is machine learning? Well, machine learning is defined as an application of artificial intelligence that provides computer systems the ability to automatically learn a skill and improve from experience without explicitly being programmed. Now, this is the part that really confuses software engineers. And this is the key difference between traditional or conventional programming and what we're moving into is the idea of teaching computers how to perform a task. Typically, developers would write algorithms to instruct the computer how to do a task. Now, the difference here is that you don't write algorithms to solve a problem. Algorithms are written so that they themselves can figure out solutions to problems. And that's really kind of the inverse of what we're used to as software engineers. Now, here's the good news. You're not going to have to, in most situations, you're not going to have to write algorithms that figure out solutions for themselves. Most of this research has already been done, and tools like Scikit-Learn for Python or Azure ML Studio just provide you with the pre-made algorithms. So in other words, all you really have to do is assemble the right algorithms and pass them the right parameters to solve the problem. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. It is very much the inverse of what traditional software engineering has been. 
As machine learning goes, there's actually three general types of machine learning. There's supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Now, while that sounds a bit complicated, it's actually quite simple, and I can prove to you that you already are familiar with a lot of these concepts. So, for example, uh, if you were given a choice between a picture set of cats and dogs, so the idea is you create some kind of computer vision solution that given a photograph of a dog or a cat, it will come back with an answer. So for supervised learning, the example would be you tell the computer which photos contain a cat and which ones contain a dog. In unsupervised learning, you give the computer pictures of cats and dogs and it will automatically cluster those into groupings of pictures of cats and pictures of dogs. Now here's a very interesting uh, new line of research uh, where it's reinforcement learning, where you reward the computer for right answers and you punish the computer for wrong answers. Now, it's hard to say exactly how do you punish or reward a computer, but bear with me now. So one of the examples is, um, you know, given the example of say of cake, Unsupervised learning would be the cake. And basically, in order to accomplish a reliable uh, outcome, you have to supply a large amount of samples. We're talking sometimes tens of thousands of images of cats and tens of thousands of images of dogs, sometimes even maybe more. Depends on your particular problem space. Now, supervised learning would be, well, the icing on the cake. The advantage here is that you can provide less sample data to the algorithms. The disadvantage here is that the sample data has to be labeled, meaning you have to tell the algorithms which are pictures of cats and which are pictures of dogs. Now here's the interesting uh, angle here is the that would be the cherry on top, so to speak, uh, would be reinforcement learning, uh, where this actually would provide the least amount of samples. And the idea is that you would issue some kind of reward to the computer or a punishment to the computer if it got the answer wrong. Now, this is actually most like how humans and animals learn. For instance, when you were a child, whenever you saw an animal, an adult probably pointed out and said, that's a dog. And then if you saw a cat and you've never seen a cat before and you just said you pointed to it and you said that's a dog the adult presumably would say no that's a cat now that's a form of reinforcement learning the punishment doesn't necessarily have to be severe it just has to be feedback based on the answer put forth so over time as you saw more dogs and more cats in more varied scenarios and environments your neural network learned to process and determine what's a cat and what's a dog. So now it's time to test out all this theory on a real live neural network. That's right, we're gonna take all this theory and put it to the test. And you may be wondering, well, what neural network are we going to test this on? Well, the answer is simple. The human brain. Specifically, yours. I'm going to show you several pictures of cats and dogs. And you're going to tell me which is which. Okay, ready? Here's the first one. Is this a cat or is this a dog? If you said dog... You were correct. Congratulations. Next picture. Are you ready? Go. Is this a cat? Or is this a dog? So, so far, you're hopefully two for two. But don't get too overconfident. What about this picture? Is that a cat? Or a dog? Are you sure? And if so, what made you come to the conclusion that you came to? Or did you find yourself, well, for lack of a better term, 
waffling. And it turns out there might be a good reason for that. But most of all, I wanted to demonstrate that natural neural networks can be, well, fooled just as easily as artificial neural networks. So clearly, you have experience distinguishing between cats and dogs. But to understand how a machine learns the difference between cats and dogs, we have to think like a machine. First, we need to discuss the type of problem we're trying to solve, and that is binary classification. Basically, an object is either a cat or a dog. It's not like we were doing multi-class classification where we would have pictures of cows, horses, goats, and sheep. I'll cover that in another course. But for now, it's important to understand how to learn like a machine. Right away, it's important to understand how a machine views the world. Given a set of data about cats and dogs, can we teach a machine to identify the differences based on various descriptive qualities of the two different types of animals? Weight, height, coat color, fur type, that sort of thing. It's also important to note now that this is going to be a different thought experiment than would be if I were covering computer vision, where you show the computer a picture of a cat, and it knows that it's a cat, versus a dog. Although many of the same concepts are similar, it's a lot simpler to deal with descriptive data. So given this data set here, we have a list of cats and a list of dogs. This is an example of supervised learning because we know the ground truth. The next step is to pass this to a machine learning algorithm. And the idea here is that the computer algorithm will discover relationships between the various fields of data that describe the animal. Essentially, the algorithm can run through a number of scenarios and hypotheses and then test that against test data. So the first step is actually splitting the source data into a test set and a training set. That gives us the chance to test the algorithm's results against data. Now it's best to do this randomly so that you get a nice clean representation of the types of data that will be input into the algorithm at some future date. It's also incumbent upon you, the data scientist, to propose various hypotheses. Perhaps weight is a factor in determining is this animal a dog or is it not? Another factor that may come up would be shape of the snout or the nose. Uh, in cats, it's clearly more triangular, and in dogs, it's generally more circular. Another key difference between cats and dogs is that cats typically have pointy ears. Now, dogs do have pointy ears, but that's usually because they've been surgically altered or docked, usually at birth. But in their natural state, dog ears are floppy. However, there's a problem with the input data. It only records whether or not an animal's ears are pointy or floppy. Now, for humans, that's how we think in terms of words. But for machine algorithms, well, they prefer to deal with numbers. So we're going to have to take our raw data and do some processing. Now, very often in the field of machine learning and data science, a big chunk of the work is shaping the data or cleaning the data, also known as munging the data or wrangling the data. Now, in this example of a dozen or so records with a dozen or so fields, it's not a lot of work. Now, consider that in a lot of cases, you'll be dealing with big data sets. It is, after all, called big data. Now, the tools and practices and skill sets needed to munge and clean data at scale are way outside the scope of this course, but just know that you'll be spending quite a bit of time doing it. So for here, it's actually pretty easy. I'll assign one value, say one for a pointy ear, and zero for, well, 
floppy or rounded ears. You'll also notice that in my sample data set here, I have some missing values. For instance, in this case, I don't have a weight. So what do I do? Do I come up with a random number and put that in there? No, because that would potentially disrupt the algorithm. Should I put the average value of weight? Well, again, that could disrupt the results and give us something less than ideal. So in this case, I'm just going to cross out the entire line. Now, there are cases where you could easily place the average value or put in a zero value or put in the median value for any missing data. It all really depends on the bigger picture and what exactly you're trying to measure or predict. And you'll get a feel for that as you do more data science experiments. Next up, I'm going to create a calculated field because, well, I think maybe there's a correlation between height and length. So I'll go do that now. I'll create a ratio of height and length. I'll also take the species column and move that to the end. And then I'll rename that to label. Label is the term in machine learning to the value that we're hoping to predict. And in this case, my label is the species of animal. Now let's pretend we're machines and let's take a look at the data. Do we see any patterns in there? For instance, is weight a good indicator of species? Well, it kind of is, uh, and it kind of isn't. Uh, so it is a moderately good indicator. Uh, clearly, dogs tend to be heavier than cats. So you're rarely going to get a cat that is over, say, you know, 20 pounds or so. Um, those tend to be small dogs and very, very large cats. So weight alone is not a good indicator. Similarly, uh, as there are a lot of smaller breed dogs, well, it's also a factor, but it is not a conclusive factor. Uh, same goes for length, and as we can see, the height-length ratio is uh, almost always roughly 2 to 1 within you know my plus or minus 10%. So again, that's not exactly a stellar indicator either. There is a uh, interesting note here in terms of tail length uh, is that cats do tend to have longer tails. However, that's not always the case as some dogs do have long curly tails. Now moving over to the right where you have the ear indicator, the ear indicator does neatly match up, but it's not perfect as two dogs do have ear indicators that they have pointy ears. Now, this is probably due to the fact that they had their ears cropped, and that alone is not a perfect indicator. Now, I'll move over to nose, and as you can see, we may have just found the magic formula. In this sample set of data, it's accurate in every case. However, it's risky to rely on one single field to determine your outcome, because, well, what if that field is missing in some of your data set? Or what if that data is wrong? Then your entire assumption is wrong. Now, this is a very simple example, and rarely will there be a very clear winner in, you know, just under 10 records of data. But this brings up the point of where do you draw the line between cats and dogs? So for instance, I'll graph several properties on this chart here, and we can take a look exactly where we should draw that line or decision boundary. In order to best understand decision boundaries, it's probably best to view this data on a chart. First, let's take a look of the chart of height compared to weight. Now you'll see that there's a cluster down towards the lower left of smaller, shorter animals versus you have three kind of edge cases. Now clearly the one in the upper right is very tall and very heavy. That's clearly a dog. And if you remember the chart, that's Jack. If you look um, towards the middle, uh, it's not that heavy, that dog, but it is rather tall. 
Uh, things get more complicated as you get down towards the under 20 pounds and under 30 in height. You'll see that you have a cluster of dogs and cats. Now here's another way to look at the same data. Uh, this is nose type. Uh, basically, uh, one is cat, zero is dog, and that's plotted for weight. So you'll see that with dogs, you have a pretty wide distribution from just over 10 pounds to just under 90 pounds. Whereas cats, they tend to cluster in the 10 to mid-20 range. So pretending that we drew the boundary of which animal is a cat versus which one is a dog at anything below, say, 20 pounds, we would actually be fairly accurate. In fact, if you look at the data, three of the four animals on the cat side of the boundaries are, in fact, cats. And all of the animals on the dog side of the boundary are dogs. Now, you may be tempted to think, well, why can't I draw a line around that one exception dog? In other words, curving the line a bit. Well, the problem with that is something called overfitting. It's possible you can create a model that fits your training data and your test data so well that it's effectively useless in the real world. In other words, if your model is too good to be true, then it probably is. The main takeaway from that thought experiment should be how decisions are made in binary classification models and that distance from the decision boundary matters in the sense that the closer an item is to the decision boundary, the more ambiguous it is. And that really underscores the importance of having good sample data to train your models on. Bad data in, bad decisions out. So if I were to train an algorithm to learn the differences between cats and dogs, I would need to provide lots of samples of the most cat-like cats and the most dog-like dogs, so my algorithm can learn the true difference between two types of animals. So in conclusion, we discussed the importance of data in the 21st century economy, and how that raw data in and of itself has no significant business value. It's truly when it is analyzed and explored where you can derive true insights from it. And that data science is a skill any software engineer can master. Thirdly, we discuss the role of statistics in data science and how your journey into data science will be a lot smoother if you understand some of the core basics of statistics and statistical terms. And finally, we ran through a thought experiment where we took a look at some data, wrangled that data a bit by cleaning it, and shaping it so that it was more suited to a machine learning algorithm. We then explored the data by creating different visualizations, comparing relations between different fields, then created a basic model using some of the insights discovered during exploration. And finally, we learned about the dangers of overfitting, meaning that if your machine learning model performs too well on your tests, then that's a sign that it may be an overfitted model and effectively useless for the real world.